1994, I carefully watched the news of the genocide taking place in Rwanda. I was shocked by the indifference of my fellow Americans to what was going on in Rwanda, and I was angered by the refusal of the American government and other governments to intervene to stop the bloodshed. I'm a social scientist, and after the Rwandan genocide was over, my colleagues and I began to study why it is that people who care so much about helping individuals uh, in distress, if they can, care so little about stopping genocide and mass atrocities. And what we found after a number of years of research uh, was very disturbing. I can summarize it in one sentence. The more who die, the less we care. I'll say it again because it's not only disturbing, it's, uh, it's a terrible thing to think about for a civilized society. The more who die, the less we care. Why is that? Uh, today I'll try to uh, explain what we found as to why we behave that way and how we can not behave that way, how we can change this uh, complacency towards genocide and mass atrocities. So let me first note that the indifference to mass suffering that I'll talk about today is not the result of our being bad people. It's the result of certain things that go on our, in our mind that deceive us and, if we're not careful, make us think that some problem is okay when it really isn't. So I'll try to describe that in detail. So there's some obvious reasons why powerful nations are reluctant to intervene and stop a genocide or mass atrocity. It's dangerous, it's difficult, it's costly, and there are political risks. But in addition, there are two psychological factors that, provide, that, that give us obstacles for action, and that's what I'll focus on today. The first of these is what we call psychic numbing. It reflects the fact that the statistics, the numbers that we get about killing and mass atrocities, fail to create an emotional response in us. They're just numbers or statistics. Someone said that statistics are human beings with the tears dried off. So that's the first problem, psychic numbing. The second problem is a false sense of powerlessness that we get when we see that the problem is big and we can only uh, be a small part of it. We can't solve that whole problem. And sometimes we walk away and don't even do what we can do, which could be important. So let's consider first uh, psychic numbing. And in order to understand it, we have to understand something important about the way we think. We think in two ways, fast and slow. And the fast system of thinking is intuitive. It relies on quick impressions and generates feelings in us. We use these feelings to guide us uh, through our day. It's like a compass. The slow thinking is what we're, to to uh, what we're taught to do in school. It's logical, it relies on uh, arguments, and, and uh, uses numbers and calculations. And so both of these modes of thinking uh, uh, interact in our brains um, all the time. But most of the time, fast thinking dominates. It dominates the slow thinking because it's easier to do, uh, because it, it feels right, and it usually works. It gets us you know, what we want to, to accomplish during the day. But fast thinking has a problem. It doesn't scale up. It doesn't understand genocides or mass atrocities or other large-scale uh, catastrophes. And I'll try to explain why that is. So think of these two important questions that I'll explain. One is, how should we value human lives as the number of lives at risk increase? How should we value those lives? The second is, how do we value human life as the number of lives increases? OK, so this next slide shows us uh, the answer to the first question uh, in, two, in two forms. How should we value human lives? The figure on the left reflects the thoughts that every human life is of equal value, which means as the number of lives at risk increase, the value of protecting those lives 
or the importance of the, the, the felt importance of protecting them should increase in a straight line. It's just adding, adding up the lives. But in some cases, uh, where uh, if the number of lives at risk or, or the number of deaths exceed a certain threshold, uh, a genocide might occur. You know, the society or our culture would, uh, would collapse. And in that case, the very next lives at risk are even more important to protect than the previous ones in order to prevent this uh, genocide. So you see then the curve of how we should act uh, goes up steeply as we get to that threshold uh, of genocide. So uh, this is, you know, these are some thoughts about how we should act to protect human lives. But how do we act to protect human lives? Well, here are um, two ways that we've discovered through our research that illustrate how we do react. And you can see these two curves are very different than the ones that I just showed before. The one on the left is a psychic numbing curve, uh, and the one on the right I'll dis dis uh, discuss in a minute. So the psychic numbing reflects the fact that the very first life is the most important life to protect, and the curve rises steeply from zero to one. Two lives don't feel twice as important to protect. Uh, they, we often feel more that two are more important than one, but not twice as important. And then by the time we consider some larger number, like say 80, 87 lives are threatened, you know, how do we feel about that? Here's a, this is des uh, describing what I'm talking about here. So you see the, the, how big a change there is from zero to one. One, uh, two lives are not twice as valued as one. And then if we think about 87 lives at risk, and then we learn, oh, no, it's 88, you won't feel any different for 88 than 87. It's on the flat part of the curve. Uh, you know, we, the feeling system, this fast thinking, it loses sensitivity as the numbers increase. But it's even worse than this. There's another problem that in some cases, as the number of, of lives at risk increase, it's not that we, the, we, we become insensitive, it is that we start to lose feeling completely. We just uh, don't, un we, we don't feel the reality and we walk away, we don't care. So, for example, my colleagues and I did a study and we found that uh, this begins even with two people at risk. That is, you care about one person and in some cases, when there are two people in front of you that you need to help, uh, you care less than you did when there was one. It, this reflects sort of a collapse of, of compassion. So when we think of empathy, we usually try to understand empathy as putting yourself in the shoes of another person. So you can understand how they feel and you know, what kind of person they are. You, can, you, you empathize with them. But what if there are two people? How do you put yourself in the shoes of two people? So this, uh, this image is a sculpture by a, a, a Cuban artist named Juan Capote who created a shoe for two people. And you can see it's a very awkward, uh, clumsy looking shoe. It would be very awkward to try to put yourself in that shoe. And the human mind has the same awkwardness when it looks at two people, tries to grasp the essence of two people at once. You know, it can't do it as well as if there's only one person. So if you start to lose empathy even slightly at the number two, no wonder you can't empathize or feel for thousands or, or for millions of people. So this is the arithmetic of compassion. Uh, it's a non-rational arithmetic. And let me illustrate with another example of how we how we can overcome this psychic numbing. And we don't have to accept it. There are ways that we can break through the numbing and create uh, feelings. I'll illustrate it with an example from the Syrian war. Um, the war started in 2011. By 2015, some 250,000 people had died in the war. Many, few people cared about what was happening. You can tell that most, there was little interest because if you look at searches under Google uh, for Syria or refugees, Syrian refugees, there was almost no interest or activity. Then in September of 2015, 
something happened that changed things. Maybe you can think of what it was. Uh, it was a photograph. It was a, uh, it was a photograph of a Syrian boy, Elan Kurdi. He and his family were fleeing, trying to reach the shores of Turkey. Their boat capsized. Uh, Elan uh, drowned close to the shore and was washed up on the beach. This picture went around the world. And four hours after the picture was released, it had been seen by 20 million people. So my colleagues and I studied the impact of this photograph. For example, Sweden took in 150,000 Syrian refugees in 2015. And the Swedish Red Cross set up a fund to care for these refugees. That fund was receiving about $8,000 a day um, up until the point of this photograph. The day after the photograph was seen, the donations jumped from 8,000 to 430,000. Why was it that the 250,000 deaths prior to that point hadn't created um, you know, an in the interest? Why did it take one photograph to do it? Again, this is a, you know, shows uh, the problem, the strange way that our minds work. Now, there's another problem uh, that is psychological that uh, reduces our tendency to act when we should, and that is a false sense of powerlessness. You know, even when we can do something important, uh, it may not feel important, so we don't do it. And that is because we help other people, not only because they need our help, but because we feel good about helping them. Economists call this the warm glow of satisfaction you get when you help someone. And the problem with the feeling system is it's indiscriminate. It lets, it lets irrelevant feelings come in and, and integrate with the relevant feelings and, and sort of mess them up. So for example, we found in our studies that if you're thinking about helping someone and then you learn there are other people that you can't help, it doesn't feel as good to help them, and you don't help them. So here's an example of the kind of experiment we did that, that demonstrates this. We gave people the opportunity to donate on behalf of a small child, seven years old, who was facing starvation. We showed people her photograph, her name, and her age. A fair number of people donated. Then we brought in a second group, and we gave them the same opportunity to donate to the same child. But next to her picture, we put some statistics, the statistics showing that she was one of millions in her region who were starving. We thought that by putting these statistics next to her image, it would show people that this is a big problem and they should really help this child. The opposite uh, happened. The donations dropped almost in half when people saw that she was one of millions. Apparently, it didn't feel as good to help this child when you realized that there were millions of children that you weren't helping, so you didn't help. Uh, but it doesn't even have to be millions of children uh, that you can't help that can demotivate you from doing the help you can. We did a second experiment. We had three groups of people. One group uh, was given the opportunity to, to help this, uh, this child. A second group was given the opportunity to help a second child, a different child. A third group was given the opportunity to help uh, they saw both of these children, and, and they were told that their donation would go to one or the other, but not both. The donations dropped compared to the individual. So what we've learned from these, these studies is that, that anywhere from a mil millions to even one person whom you can't help makes you feel less good about helping, and you may then uh, not help, do the help that you're able to do. I mean, people could donate uh, to, the, you know, to these children, and they didn't because they were demotivated by the, uh, the fact that they couldn't help everyone. This is wrong. This is, this is the way our feelings react. We have to guard against it. You know, just because you can't help everyone doesn't mean you shouldn't help the people that you can, that you can help. It's another example of this perverse arithmetic of compassion that results from relying on your feelings rather than on slow thinking. OK, so what's the next chapter in this story? Uh, I tell these, uh, these stories about research not to uh, depress people about the strange, bizarre ways our minds work, but in the hopes that if we understand this, 
we can guard against it, we can, we can uh, create ways of overcoming this and making the world a better place where we're not so complacent about mass atrocities. Let me, uh, let me just mention a few suggestions based on this research. For those of you who are refugees, let us, let us come to know you. Tell us your stories. Uh, uh, let us come to know you as individuals. So tell us your stories, uh, your hopes, your, your dreams, your struggles, and your successes. Don't let us think of you as statistics. For those of you who are citizens who care a lot uh, about humanity, human rights, but feel overwhelmed and powerless uh, to stop things, big things like genocide or mass atrocities, um, when you get the statistics or the numbers showing how big a problem is happening somewhere in the world, stop, use th slow thinking, try to imagine in some of the individuals who are being uh, affected by this problem. You know, the, think of individuals beneath the surface of this, uh, of this statistic. Think also of the words of a survivor of the Holocaust who said, it's not that there were six million Jewish people murdered by the Nazis. There was one person murdered again and again and again six million times. Think of the individuality. And also, uh, with regard to this feeling of um, lack of power, one way you can address that is by joining forces with NGOs and others who are dedicated to these problems and are doing heroic work. So amplify your own ability by, by joining forces with others who have power. And speaking of power, those of you in, in positions of power recognize the limitations of the laws and policies and institutions that have failed to ensure uh, that never again would genocide and mass atrocities take place. Use your slow thinking to get the arithmetic of compassion right and create laws and institutions and procedures that will address mass suffering with the same intensity that we put towards uh, addressing the needs of an individual. The stakes are high. The world will continue to turn a blind eye towards genocides and mass atrocities unless we who care understand and combat this numbing arithmetic of compassion. Thank you. <laughs>